31st book review. We're reviewing the book Speak by Tunde. And uh, I have enjoyed the book. I will give my ideas on some of the topics and what I picked out on it. And uh, it has been an amazing book. Speak is actually an acronym and it stands for Surrender, Power, Empathy, Authenticity, and Knowledge. So the various areas, which are 12 in total, each speaks to one of these one of these five key pillars. I've been trying to remind myself one of these pillars every single day so that I remember them, I'm able to memorize them, understand them, and being able to use them in my day-to-day -day life. So to start us off, I'm going to ask Claire to start and uh, she'll give us a bit of what she thinks. And then we'll have Carol today. Thank you very much, Carol, for joining our review today. And then I'll also speak later. Thank you and over to you, Claire. Thank you, Primera. And uh, welcome, welcome to everyone who is on the call. And uh, this is our first book review of 2023. And uh, we're reviewing Speak. I, I was looking forward to, <laughs> to this book and to this review. Uh, a number of people had recommended it um, for the book club. So when I read it, I was like, no, this can't come in August. It can't come in June. It has to come in January. And I really thank uh, the team that is behind uh, selecting all these books, the amazing books that we are going to have this year. And uh, on the group, I encouraged people to I, I, I think I, I said, I, I hope everyone finds the time to read uh, this book. Why? Because uh, in this book, we find not a perfect person. We find someone who is open about high insecurities, about uh, failure, about taking risks, about making mistakes about getting stuck for many years, about um, not being sure of the next step and the future. And we find that we are all in that space. We are all in that space. We may be at different stages of our lives, but we go through um, those phases. Uh, and the book begins with, uh, she highlights a moment when she had gone for an, for for exercise and she was walking, it was her first uh, cycling class. And when she was walking on the street, it suddenly hit her that the kind of energy that she felt, the kind of excitement that she had, is some is it's something that she she calls it like a blue light went through her her body like that uh, aha moment. And she realized that, oh my God, I can actually do this as a career. I can do this. Uh, I can do this for the rest of my life. Why? Because it, it gave her the energy, that kind of high and that energy. And she felt that she, she needed not only to, 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 to exercise, but to be able to share. And throughout the book, she, she shares uh, her different stories of how she, she took this and scaled it. Now, in order for us to understand the background, you need to understand who she is right now. She's actually the face of, uh, of uh, one of the most prominent uh, um, cosmetic, Primera will remind me. And then she's a uh, face of Nike. And uh, she's really, the fact that we are reading about her shows that she's famous. Chapter one begins with a story about her not fitting into, uh, she was meant to be a maid for her auntie's wedding and she was not able to fit in, in the clothes. Why? Because she was overweight. And she shares these kind of insecurities because we deal with the same insecurities and they limit us. 
they limit us in uh, in our career, they limit us in the things that we can do, they limit us uh, the decisions that we can make, the people we can love, you know, the, the hobbies we can enjoy. You know, when you're, <laughs> when you're overweight, you'd like to swim, but you're embarrassed, like embarrassed about the body. So you can't actually put on a swim, swimming costume, you can't swim. So it limits you from some of these things. You want to make presentations, you want to, to go on TV, you want to be in a magazine and you can't because of your body. And so she shares that uh, story about her fight and her uh, fight with uh, her body weight because she was always bigger than um, um, the, the rest of the people. And that experience from the wedding dress where her mom had to sew two dresses for her to, to, to wear, um, sharing that kind of uh, vulnerability with the weight, I think it was a, a sort of a, 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 a something I could re relate with. And so she, she tries to, to show um, that the not so pretty, you know, sides of her, of her story throughout the book. And um, I related with uh, that part. And so when they asked me to review, I said, no, I will review page, uh, I'll review the part of the dress. And um, that's chapter one, the perfect dress, and and also authenticity. the The reason why this is very important is because as women, we we are, we we take our appearance as our um, our fit. You know, just because she was overweight does not mean that she could not um, enjoy life. She could not put on a nice dress. So she felt that if she got a different dress, she would instead actually stand out instead of fitting in. And so when they saw two dresses together, she was able to, to, to fit in. What does that even mean? As, as women, we are um, very uh, ashamed of our bodies, of the way we look. It may not even be about weight. It may be the skin color. Throughout the story, she talks about the fact that she was the only black, black. Uh, if you've seen the cover, you know she's really, really like dark, dark skinned. So she stood out. She went through a lot of um, stigma, but this does not stop her. So in order for us to move on in a uh, in our in our careers, in our in our lives with our purpose, we need to um, this is what she speaks about in her first in her first chapter. And it goes on to that chapter uh, goes into chapter two where she talks about her change in career. She decided to go to LA to pursue uh, a career in, uh, in uh, makeup, yeah? And for 15 years, 15 years, she was, uh, um, she called herself an expert in makeup. All she did was stand at the counter. And if you approach the counter, you could, she could tell you that this foundation matches this, this lipstick will work for you. And she did that for so many years, only to realize to realize that she actually did not like her dream career. So, and her, you can imagine having 15 years of a, a dream career only to find that you actually did not enjoy it. And um, throughout the books that we have read, we find that we are reminded constantly to reflect on uh, what is really fulfilling in our lives. Is the job that you're doing fulfilling? Is this what you want? All the different insecurities are actually stopping you from pursuing something that will truly make you happy. And the mistake that we make, uh, that we make is sometimes we refer, we assume that our jobs are our purpose. And yet these are two different things. It's like your purpose is your calling and your job 
is your career. I think it's uh, Steve Harvey who says that very well, that we confuse the two, a career and a calling. So many of us are stuck. You know, you've been in a job for 15 years and you're stuck and you're sure that this is your fate in life because you have input it in your mind that this is the only thing I can do. This is the only thing I can achieve. This is, I can't go higher than this. I can't do better than this. And throughout the book, she talks about being of service. The reason as to why she opted to go into the cycling and she had that vision, grand vision to impact the world is because she wanted to be of service. She wanted to energize people. She has a podcast that talks about fitness. I think fitness flipped. She distorts the, the ideas that exercise should be painful, should be um, like a chore, should be, it, she changes it. It can be an exciting time. So she brings back a lot of joy into exercise and in that way um, is of service. So now that is sort of like the first chapter talks about weight, it talks about the insecurities and how we should be really authentic with our lives. But then it goes on to uh, the second chapter and throughout the book, it talks about the different stages of her life, the uncertainties of her life. And um, as we end uh, chapter one, she talks about, there's a quote there that uh, do not shrink yourself to fit into small spaces. If the space does not fit, find a new one. And I feel that that was uh, uh, one of the, the best uh, quotes in the book. And then another one, uh, of course, about authenticity is when truth and trust intersect, you can be your most authentic self. So when you reflect about your life, do you think that you are living at the truest level of your life? Are you, or you're living your parents' dream, you're living your spouse' dream, you're living a career that you've always wanted because you saw uh, Kathy was following that path, Primera was following that path. Are you really, really living your true life? And this is advice that, uh, the mother gave her when she was struggling with her weight. And she also mentioned, uh, just I'll share one more quote about uh, the body image. She told her, if you want to change things, you have to change things. If you want to change things, you have to change things. What this meant that if you don't like the way you look, it's in your power to change, to change it. At the beginning, Primera talked about the acronym SPEAK. She calls us to speak. Find your, find your voice, trust your gut, and get from where you are to where you want to be. So as we begin the new year, and as we listen to the rest of the presenters, we need to think about surrender, yeah? What does it mean to surrender, yeah? What about power? What power do you hold? Yeah, you hold the power to decide the direction of your life. You cannot leave it to someone else. That power is yours. You can actually achieve whatever you set your mind to. And then we shall um, see the other, the other topics. Um, I think Carol will speak about that, empathy, and also Primera. And then just briefly about uh, chapter two. It, um, chapter two talks about her, her career, but also talks about her loss. This, um, the author experienced a lot of loss. When you write a book like, uh, like this one, you need, you, you must be open and, uh, and genuine in whatever you put in uh, out there. And so she talks about her loss. When you see this image and she's written a bestseller and she's living, she has millions of followers, we assume that it has always been that way. No, she went through a lot of grief, 
and a lot of loss. One, she lost a baby brother um, at the age of 19. Now you can imagine um, a young man, in just a young boy in the prime of his life passes away. And just after three years, the father passed away. And then another three years, and she lost her mom. And, uh, and so that kind of grief, she talks about it uh, throughout the book. How do you deal with challenges? How do you deal with hard times such as those? And so we reflect also on the loss that many people experienced uh, during the past two years. Some lost spouses, some lost parents, some lost friends, lost colleagues, lost siblings uh, to COVID-19. And many are still grieving, you know, they're grieving. Many of us may have moved on with our lives. Oh, it's, we, we are past that. But it leaves a lot of wounds. But how do you uh, overcome um, uh, such kind of loss? And she addresses... Uh, it in the in the in the book you can overcome that through service you can overcome that through uh like valuing um every moment that you have with with your loved one and i think that is one of the lessons we learned from one of the books the power of moments every moment you have with the loved one should be treasured and so throughout this year uh, I just encourage everyone that the time that we have is very, very precious, not only for our loved ones and in the fear of we may not see them again, no, but in the fact that time is a valuable asset. Yeah. And as women, we are, we've learned how to waste it. You know, we've learned how to waste it. We waste it with uh, many trivial things, the amount of social media time, the amount of grumbling, negative talk, all that, all those minutes and those hours actually turn into our lives. And so I've, uh, I've, these are like, when I, I was thinking about that kind of loss, I reflected on, uh, on my, my own life, my own um, um, insecurities with my with my body, with my weight, and all these things. And I've learned from the book that if I want things to change, I must be able to change things. Yeah, so I'll stop there for now, and I will invite the next speaker to continue with uh, the next chapters. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Claire for that opening and uh, taking us through chapter one and two. I'm going to invite Kara to do uh, the next three chapters. All right, thank you, Primera. Thank you, Claire, for that introduction. Um, you're right about the, the story and everything you've said. It's, it's, a, it's a really wonderful book. And I think I'll pick up from just from where you left because in chapter three, uh, she uh, Tunde uh, labels it left foot, right foot. So I remember when I saw it, I remember thinking, oh, this is, you know, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, sort of putting one foot in front of the other and walking one step at a time, regardless of what you're seeing, you know, you just keep on put, just put one foot in front of the other. I think that's what she was trying to portray in her, in her, in her book, at least in this chapter. And it begins on, Okay, it begins on a high note, you know, in terms of her brother is graduating and it's exciting. But I remember when I saw, when she talks about she's graduating, they're excited, she flies all the way from Los Angeles to Texas to go for the graduation. She's wondering where her brother and her father, her brothers and her father are because they're supposed to be here. And if she's flown, where are they? So it begins on a high note. But at some point, um, she says something that, you know, she said, when they were taking photos after the whole graduation and they were excited for, you know, standing, laughing, talking, and they were taking a photo, she felt like mm, this is probably the last time we're going to take a picture together. And when I, when I read that, I remember thinking, ha, ah, something, <laughs> she's preparing us for something um, sad in this part of this. So I was very, very, you know, um, reading it very carefully to sort of see where is this going? What, you know, what's going to happen? What's, uh, what sad thing is going to happen? 
And like Claire says, as the story goes on, we we actually see what goes wrong. Tope, the youngest brother, the youngest, maybe the baby of the family, you know, how painful is that? Dies. And he dies at the grand young age of 19. And you know. What I like about how Tunde writes this story is that she's very open. She's very, she doesn't hold back. She shares her emotions. She shares her feelings. She shares things as they are. And so she talks about, you know, the sorrow and the, and the, the, the shock that she goes through. And I think one of the reasons I wanted to, to do this particular chapter was because I, I did help a friend with the book they had, uh, which they were writing about loss, a loss of her spouse. And, it taught me many things about grieving that I hadn't known just from reading her experience. And, and, and Tunde talks about some of these things. And I think one of the things she, she talks about is, you know, I, that sort of we are reminded of is we never know when we shall leave this earth. I mean, Tope was the baby. He was 19. Um, I think at this point, the father may have already had, uh, a, you know, a few illness, uh, illnesses stabbing him. I think the mom. We find out later about the mom, how she had also had some sicknesses. Uh, so he was the last, in fact, in the book, she kept on saying she thought it was going to be the dad that was going. So when, she, when they called her, when she realized, ah, oh, something is wrong, she was so sure it was her dad. She was like, ah, oh, what has happened to dad? And then only to find out it was the young boy. So it, it, in, I think in her book, she talks, about, she talks about different things about grieving. And she says, one of the things she says, again, like it's, it's painful. She talks about how, she knew that as a sibling, she lost her sibling. It was painful, but to see her mother and father in pain, that was a different kind of pain. And then she realized she had to step up. She realized she had to be the, the, the one to support them and to help them through all this. And we see later on, you know, throughout this, she, she sort of steps up in these difficult moments. And I think that what Tunde is trying to tell us here is left foot, right foot. Sometimes we come into these situations, we, we, we are faced with very difficult situations and we don't know how to manage them, but we've got to put the left foot in front of the right foot and, and so on and so on. And she says that sometimes you've got to feel the pain of someone in order to be, help, to be of help to them. And I think it's an important lesson because I think sometimes we, we want to escape pain. We don't want to feel the pain because sometimes it's overwhelming of another person, not even of ourselves, of another person of a friend who has maybe lost a job, of a person who has lost a spouse. We don't want to sort of feel that pain and weep with them and cry because we feel it's overwhelming or it may be embarrassing. Uh, but unless sometimes we put ourselves in that pain, we may not be of sufficient help because we do not understand, we do not allow ourselves to feel the pain the way they feel the pain. So Tunde had to do this. She had to understand how her parents were feeling the pain, take on that pain, and then be able to support them the way she felt she could support them, which was by, you know, she was took care of with her brothers, took care of the, the, you know, the whole ceremony of the funeral. She stayed for three months, you know, uh, yeah, with them, you know, and about the job. She luckily her friends sort of held fought for her, but she she realized that I had to do this. And and she 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 also told, says that once she took charge of that, she recognized that sometimes when we do these things, we learn, we learn these things, we learn, we pick lessons. And one of the quotes there she says is, you know, she says, we lose jobs, we lose loved ones, friendships fizzle, there are twisted ankles and burnt dinners and infinite smaller conflicts and challenges that we face every day. In the moment, you don't realize that your character is being developed. You're often just trying to survive. But later looking back, they become clearer. So I, she's reminding us, letting us know that when these things come, let even in the midst of all the craziness, if we can remember that at some point, the lesson I'm learning here will be helpful to me at some point. And, you know, later in the future, if, at days from now, weeks from now, now or months or years. So it's important for us to, to know that, that even in a state of sorrow, in a state of pain, a state of confusion and anger, we are picking lessons. And these lessons, we shall be able to use them at a later point in life. And, and so I think what she's also saying is that it's important for us to make the best choices that we can during those moments, however hard it is. I mean, think about it, ladies. When you are fired unfairly, how do you react? When you're in a, a relationship that is going a bit awkward and things, weird, strange things are happening, or a friendship, when a child of yours, you know, uh, disappoints you so much by a choice they have made or something they have done, 
So when these difficulties come, how do we react? How do we, you know, uh, you know, react to these things? Because the way we react is helpful because when we make the best choices as much as we can during those moments, we will then look back and say, that was a right choice. You know, I was fired unfairly, but I did not, you know, make a fool of myself or, or whatever it is. I, my spouse or this child react, did this thing but I did not react in a, in a way that, that either destroyed that relationship or a part of that relationship. I have not reacted in a way that has, you know, made, made us go further apart or made things more difficult for myself or put a stain on my, on my profile, on my status, you know? I have reacted in the best way possible because I know that later on this will come back. It will be a lesson and I'll, uh, it will be a lesson for me to look back on and to learn. So. Uh, like she says again, we don't choose what happens to us, we choose how we react to it. So today is a new day, choose to be new in it. So that chapter is about sorrow, it's about pain, but it's about putting the next foot, it's about knowing sorrow is here, pain is here, how do I deal with this pain? How do I absorb it so that I can understand it and feel it and be helpful to the other people who around me who need that help and so that I can be as helpful because I understand the pain they're going through but how do I make choices in this situation so that when years later, months later, I can look back and say, yes, I made, I learned a good lesson. I learned how to be strong. I learned how to react in the right way. So that's what chapter three at least teaches me uh, in terms of dealing with pain, dealing with difficult times, dealing with sorrow. And so we go on to chapter three, which she, which she titles The Blue Light. So like Claire talks about, this blue light is what she talks about in the beginning of the book when she's talking about how she left this, uh, this you know, exercise, uh, this day she went for this uh, exercise thing and then she's feeling like energetic and like she's on something. And, you know, that, that she talks about how, it was a very funny, the, the way she came across it, it was very funny. She was displaced, she was her job, it was tiring, it was, she's just not feeling it anymore. And then, you know, she happens one day, she's like, I need to go to the gym. I need to do something because she, she exercises. And then she goes to this, this particular, she signs up for this thing. It's a lot of money. She's like, what? This is ridiculous. $40 for just a day and a few things. Yet my gym back at home is $48 a month. Uh, but she's there anyway. She says, okay, let me get here. She gets onto the bike and they start. And it's one of the most amazing things she, you know, she feels. She says, um, she it, she experienced something she had never expected. She she felt so like on another level, another plane. And like you, like everything is just perfect. The mood, the, you know, you're feeling in this thing. And for her, she felt like it was it was a moving meditation. She felt so excited, so euphoric. And I remember thinking to myself, I asked myself, how many times have we felt that way? You know, how many times have we been there when we are doing something, and it just feels right. It feels perfect. It may not be the job. It may be the job. It could be the job you have. It may be this other thing you're doing as a side hustle. It may be a, a support you give. You know, you have a hobby, but it's a, it's something that you give either support. You maybe you sing. Who knows? Maybe you dance. But in the moment, there's a time. There are times when you go there and you feel, man, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is what it is. This is where I can give of myself. This is where my passion is at my top. That is how Tunde was feeling. And that is how, you know, she, she, she began to realize, I have another passion. I love makeup, but this is what I want to do. And I think for her, she was telling us that people, you will find yourself, that the day you find yourself in that spot where you feel, I am doing what I'm meant to be doing. This, everything feels right. Even if it's hard, even if it's difficult, you just, you just somehow, you know, you know what to say, you know how to do it, you know what to put where, you, you're feeling, even if it's challenging at that moment, you, you're just, you're going, you're with the moment, you're flowing. It's not, ah, cussing and I don't want, you're just going with it. And she's saying that when you, when you feel that, when you feel that moment, whatever it is, then stop and think. Don't let it go and say, ah, that was so nice. That was so amazing. And let it go. She's like, grab that thing because that is where we are meant to be. We are meant to be doing things like that. So like Claire said, if we're in the job that is not exciting, what is our purpose? If we are in, you know, in the business, that's not going well for us. I mean, not, we're not, you know, we're not, we're just not feeling it. Then we need to ask ourselves, what is my purpose? What is that thing where I feel alive? Where I, lit I literally feel, you know, the tips of my fingers, the tips of my toes. What is that thing? So for Tunde, that thing was, was the biking, uh, going on a bike and, and doing this thing and just living in another place. And she felt, 
I can do this for other people. If I did this, if I was here, man, I would be at the place I'm supposed to be. But then she also said, how practical is it for me to go here? Because, you know, she was at this makeup job. It was very exciting. It was very nice. It was very, you know, um, it was paying the bills. It was, you know, and she's like, I had lifestyle now. You know, I didn't have to check the bill to see if people are invited into a restaurant. I didn't have to check, ah, oh, what restaurants? Can I afford that? You know, so she was, she had a car, she had a, an apartment. I mean, she was, she was living a fairly good life, but she just wasn't happy anymore at the, with the makeup job. But she knew she was like, well, we're getting this money. I'm getting, I have a status now. I have a secure job. How do I walk away from it and go and start doing this thing? What opportunity is there? And she says, those times will come because we may be excited about this thing, but practicality, you know, hits us in the face. What do we do? Can, can we just leave this and walk away? How do we go about this? But she says something which is very interesting and, you know, something to think about. And I'll quote her. She says, when your gut tells you one thing and your insecurities tell you another, you have to choose which voice to amplify. I felt that was an amazing quote. I'll say it again. When your gut tells you one thing and your insecurities tell you another, you have to choose which voice to amplify. When we are in this place, when we feel like this is what I'm meant to be doing, this is where I'm meant to be going. Uh, but and a part of us is telling us, but what about the bills? But what about the money? But what about the experience you've made for over 10 years, 15 years? What do you do with that? Do you walk away from it? We have to understand which voice do I amplify? The insecurities or the voice that says, I can do this thing. I am meant for this. This is my purpose. And uh, so that's the place we have to come to at some point in our lives and figure out which voice do I amplify? Where do I go? And she still gives good advice. She doesn't just say, oh, go with your guts and run with it. No. She says, acknowledge logic, but turn up the volume on the voice that believes in you. And I think that's really great. You know, acknowledge logic, acknowledge that, ah, you know, I have to pay the bills. I still have to put food on the table. I still have to support people at home. I still need, you know, I, I am, I'm doing this, this degree. I need, I think I need to finish to help me. I still have all these things. But turn up the volume on the voice that believes in you, that passion, turn it up and say, how can I do more of this? Where can I find you know, opportunities to do what I want to do? How do I begin to search? Where do I need to go? You know, who do I need to talk to, to start to, you know, to begin to do this thing more and more? And, and, and Tunde, you know, she did it because she, she, she started speaking about it and started saying, you know, she didn't just keep quiet and say, well, I have this thing, I like this thing and I want to do it. But you know, she's quiet about it and just on her makeup job, but, no, she told her friends and said, guys, I feel like this is where I'm meant to be. I went there and it was amazing. So she did that. She signed up for a class. She began going there regularly. She even, you know, um, eventually signed up to, to start, you know, teaching in a small, in a small sweatshop, a place called sweatshop, because she knew this is what I want to do. So if I can have a bit of it, I can keep my day job, but if I can have a bit of it all the time, then I'm going to, I'm going to, she's not, I'm amplifying the voice that believes in me, I'm amplifying the voice that shows me this is where I want to go. So I think that as we are doing, as we are thinking about these things, we need to think about both. We need to say, yes, logic is saying I need to do this and I, I, I can't walk away from certain things. I need to fix this, I need to do that. But let me find, let me amplify that voice that tells me about my passion. Let me find ways to you know, fulfill my passion. Let me find ways to do things that I can you know, um, express myself in this way. So. You know, if you are a person who you have a job, you go to office every day, but you have this side hustle you're doing and you really feel in it, you either sell some particular kind of, you know, product, you make something, you, you do something that just brings you, you know, excitement, whatever it is, then find ways to do more of it. Find ways to tell people this, I love this thing, I'm doing this thing. You know, when opportunities, let me know and I will, I will do my best to see how I can do it. Because then we... By doing that, we amplify that voice by finding opportunities, by speaking to people, by reading about it, by pushing ourselves more and more, getting you know, opportunities to do that, we amplify that voice. And so she did that. And finally, and she talked to friends, some of the friends she talked to were Max and Christy. And you know, they, she told them, I want to do this. And she said that she was shocked that they did not tell her, but no, you've done makeup and you've been for so many years and you're so good at it. Why don't you just find a different workplace and everything? That's what I said, so why don't you go for it? What are you doing? How do you, you know, how can we help you go for what you want to do? And I think that that is something valuable I learned. It's have friends who truly know you and understand your strength, your power, your energy, and your ability to do something. 
because these friends will push you. These friends will support you. These friends will tell you as it is. They will tell you and they'll, because these friends kept on telling her, you're not happy. What is it? You don't, you're not excited anymore. What is it? And when she told them, they were able to reflect back to her and say, this is what you need to do therefore. So it's important for us to have friends who truly know who we are and can speak into our lives and can be able to support us and say, this is the thing you can do, go for it. How can we support you? And so she tries, you know, she gets into that and she wants to, she gets into, she gets a, cho a chance to do the Peloton, you know, to get to Peloton and she goes there and she's doing all these things and she's trying, but you know, she doesn't get through. She doesn't um, get the, the, the job that she wants, yet everything seemed to go so well, that, that audio, I mean, the sorry, the audition and everything went so well. She goes to Peloton, she, she's, first of all, she's picked randomly. You know, this big organization picks her randomly, says, come and try with us. She sends tapes, they like it, they call her to actually to their place where they are. She does auditions. Everyone is looking at her like, man, you've got this thing. And then the email comes through saying, we didn't get it. And the disappointment was deep. She could not believe she could not she didn't get it. How? She was so sure the blue light had shone. She had seen her dream. How? And then the doubts began to come in. And, and this is what happens. She's telling us, this is what happens when we don't uh, succeed at first. We begin to doubt. We begin to say, ah, maybe it's not for me. Maybe I overassumed. Maybe this is, that I'm not supposed to be doing this. I should stick to where I am. But she says, she, she encourages us in her writing. She says, we shouldn't make, we shouldn't let those doubts, you know, um, assail us and, and keep us where we are. And she talks about that, more of that in, in chapter five, which is a starting point. And in chapter five, she talks a bit about her, her father's life. She talks about how he came to the US, how he struggled, how he sacrificed so much to have the, ch the children grow up. But also now when he had sort of, when the children were doing better, he sort of felt now is my time to do something for myself, which was really beautiful. And so he wanted to do a degree in chiropractic medicine. So he was excited. He began to, he started paying for himself, his tuition. You know, he was getting there, learning things. And then his sister calls him and says, Manage, please take care of my sons. Please help me. I need to, I want them to get a better life. I'm struggling here. And so he makes a sacrifice and he raises his nephews. He never goes back to school. And Tunde says at some point she could see that he resented the fact that he did not go back to school. But he was happy to have helped his sister and his nephews. But Tunde knew what she wanted and she wanted different. She didn't want to give up on her dream. She didn't want to decide that maybe makeup is where I have to be. I have to make the money. I have to do the job. She said, no, I'm going to follow my dream. And that's where she talks again about doubt. And she says, I'll quote her. She says, when doubt arises, we worry. We fear it. I was stuck, but doubt couldn't be the sticking point. Doubt is an internal alert system thing, saying that it's time to shift. So that's a good thing. You know, let's just let me say it again. Doubt is an internal alert system saying that it's time to shift. So when we begin to doubt something, rather than making it make us feel like we are failure, we must be able to say, what is this doubt telling me? Why am I doubting? What is it saying to me? Is it saying to me, I need to improve? Is it saying to me, I need to actually walk away from what I've been doing? Is it saying to me, I need to do things differently? So she says, rather than push doubt away, we need to lean into it, sort of to hear what the doubt is saying, not to make it push us down, but to make it say, what are you saying to me? Doubt what are you saying to me? This is what you're saying. This is what I determined to do. Uh, so she talks about how doubt is an important part of life. It is there for a reason. Eh? It's not there to push, it's there for a reason. And so um, after all that sadness and of not getting the job and everything, Tunde says she started to get out of her bad mood and to, to begin doing the best she could. Because at the makeup place, she was so, ah, she just didn't feel it anymore. But now when she realized that I can't keep on doing this, I can't keep on going to the makeup, you know, to my, my, my office and feel so low and feel I like, don't like this place. I want to be somewhere else. I want to do, you know, this writing, but I didn't get this thing. She realized it wasn't making, it didn't, it didn't matter. It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't helping. And so she decided that I need to get out of this bad mood and start to do the best I can do wherever I am. And I like what she said, because she said, she decided that if I was at the makeup place, I was still going to do the best that I could, even as I looked for something else. So I decided, okay, I'm at the makeup place. Let me stay here. Let me go to the sweatshop. Let me take on the opportunity, start working at it. Let me see how I can transition from this place to the other place as I begin to work to where I want to go. Because the, mood, the bad mood puts us in a, in, a, in, a, in a bad place. 
and and she gives she shares an important quote, a quote that I felt was nice by a guy called Robin Azon, which says, "You've made it through a hundred percent of your bad days." I thought that was really really nice. Like guys, it doesn't matter. You guys, it doesn't matter what yesterday was like. It doesn't matter what three days ago was like. It doesn't matter what twenty twenty one was like or twenty twenty when it was so bad. We made it through, man. We made it through every day, whether we lost our loved ones, whether we lost our jobs, whether we lost our business. We made it through those 24 hours. We can make it again. I, I, for me, that was one of the biggest, the, the most loveliest spots in that place. That we made it through. Wake up again. Left foot, right foot. Left foot, right foot. So I feel like the chapter five was 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 her telling us we can do it, even with the, after the bad days, after the doubt, after the, the 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 failure, the disappointment. We can still do it. And what do we do where we are right now? The disappointment. We make the most of where we are. We, if we're in this job that is frustrating, if we're in this business that is just not getting where we want it to be, if we're in this relationship that is we feel is struggling, we sit back and say, how can I make the most of this? What can I do that makes me happy? What can I do that, you know, that even if I don't like this job as much, I am still showing up. I am still doing the best I can because we will take those lessons to the next job. We will take those uh, lessons to the next, you know, maybe relationship. So we keep asking ourselves, what can I do better? How can I do better? And do that so that when the opportunity comes now, when the, the job that we wanted comes, the business starts to get up, the relationship is now working, we are at a good place and we're not struggling to get away from that bad place to come to a good place. So ladies, we've made it through 100% of our bad days, whether it was yesterday or well, last week, we are here. And hopefully we'll make, it, we'll make it through the end of today and tomorrow, we'll step again, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol, for that. Thank you. And uh, over to you, Claire, for the next couple of chapters. Thank you, um, Primera. Thank you, Carol. I was listening to, to Carol and, <laughs> and taking notes and highlighting parts, part of the books that I had missed a few quotes that I had missed. And thank you, Carol. And uh, Carol, I think, has uh, really, really um, lived out the book. She's uh, joining us as a panelist for the first time. And, and it's amazing what, uh, that she's doing such a great job. Yeah, I invite you to, <laughs> to review the next book. So thank you, Carol. Thank you for... for coming on board and I'm just going to go through the highlights of chapter six uh, to eight and uh, nine and then um, someone else will take over so um, in this chapter she talks about um, uh, the different interviews that uh, she went for and uh, how she prepared for for them and the title of um, of that is second chances. Yeah, so through throughout the book, she talks about uh, personal, but mostly career, how she moved from makeup, how she went into exercising. And so this chapter focuses on how she prepared for the different interviews. There were, it was not only one interview and then she you get the job. She had to go to, to New York for the final interview. And that is, uh, is chapter the next chapter chapter seven so in this chapter the um a few things that are highlighted um the confidence to actually go out and compete um at the highest level so she talks about um the some of the uh, celebrities that who, who that were going to interview interview her and how she prepared. She prepared by reading about them, she, uh, by reading their books, she prepared by watching videos, and she had a good team around her, of friends that kept uh, assuring her that she could actually uh, compete and win at the different assignments that she was given. So 
one of the key things that I take out is not giving up. She had a series of interviews and she always approached them with confidence. She spoke about uh, her, this chapter is really a conversation with, with, um, with Cody and um, Cody always got her interview gigs, but because of the different insecurities, she felt that she could not uh, compete at, um, at um, an international level. But because of Cody and um, the coaching and the encouragement, she, she was able to go out and compete. Now, what I take out from this is the people that we put around ourselves, yeah? Sometimes you, you see a job interview on LinkedIn, you see uh, someone maybe share something on WhatsApp, and when you consult, and when you consult, they, they tell you, you know what, you're not qualified. You no, you don't, that job is not good for you. And you end up not applying. And this happens a lot. At the end of the year, you're like, you know what, I'm going to change my job. I'm going to apply for this. I'm going to do this. But you don't do it. Why? Because someone else has told you that you can't. In this chapter, uh, she talks about the encouragement uh, that she was getting from many of her, her peers. And in one of the conversations, the, they, they told her, Tunde, life comes in seasons. Everything shifts and changes. I try to get the most out of every season that I'm in because I know I'll never get it back. So even with the bad seasons, uh, Carol has really uh, talked about uh, what she went through and how she experienced a lot of loss. That was that season. And she learned her lessons and moved on to another season. So even with rejection and uh, um, the different interviews and all that, you need to be able to uh, stay focused and not give up. And most of these words did not come from within that she encouraged herself, no. It was the people that she put around her that kept on encouraging her. They kept on telling her, you can do this, you're the best, you're qualified, you can actually achieve whatever you want. And whenever she went to the interview, she had that kind of energy and she was able to, uh, to win and get the job. In chapter seven, it talks about um, knowledge, uh, a New York moment. So she had to go for the final interview in New York and she had to, she, she had to uh, go into an area that was not comfortable for her. She, she, was, she had more, uh, more qualified people competing against her. But here on page 99, she says, you have to be open to taking any direction or else when you're thrown off course, you won't find the detour that helps you to get back on, on track. Sometimes we have plans, you know, at the beginning of the year, uh, Premier Kathy and myself, we have uh, planning sessions and we always tell people, plot out the year, plan, make plans, make five-year plans, make, you know, all these plans. But your boss may have other plans. One of those plans may be firing you. Your, the economy may have other plans, you know. Someone else may have other plans. But how do you remain stable? Or on page 100, she says, the plan, after all, does not always go according to plan. You can plot out your, your month. You can plot out your year. But as you can see, obviously, through her story, things can change through just one phone call. And so she reminds us as she takes the Uber from the airport, she reflects about uh, some of these things. And uh, she talks about failure. And, um, and when, you, when you think about the kind of work that she does, it's exercise. If you've tried to lose weight, you know that you can have the keto diet, you can do the juicing, you can do the treadmill, you can do the walking all over Chanja. You can, you know, you can <laughs> try everything, but the weight will not go. 
And here she talks about, and she says it in most of her, her, her training videos, if you could watch them on YouTube. She tells you, keep on, keep on, keep on going. Just keep that sweat. And in one of the, the, the videos I, I watched this uh, in preparation for this review, she tells you to skip just five times. Then the next day, add on, just skip seven, skip 10. The next time you'll be skipping a hundred. But many times you want to skip a hundred on day one. You know, you want to run miles on day one. She encourages you just do five minutes, do two minutes. Yeah, do two minutes, five minutes, next 10. That's how you get to 200 skips, uh, you know, uh, a day. And that's a kind of um, imagery that I had in my mind that many times we want to, to excel in on day one. We want to be the best at whatever we're doing in, in, on day one. No, through her exercise, she says, you take one step at a time, like Carol's, Say, so just put one foot in front of the other. And this is something that we need to, to reflect on in our own lives. Just, even if you don't see the whole distance, just in order to keep moving, just put one foot ahead of the other. And there's also another quote, a goal is a wish, but a standard holds you accountable. So even with the many goals that we have, the beginning of this year, we know we are going to uh, accomplish this. We are going to have um, open this business. We are going to lose this much weight. You need to just have a standard, a certain standard to keep you uh, accountable. And so she goes for, 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 for the interview. Uh, of course, she gets that job. So throughout um, that, um, that interview and that process, She's getting encouragement from her from her friends. Um, uh, one of the encouragements they used to tell her is that you are a badass, you're smart, this moment is yours, this is what you are meant to do, go out and do it. So you may not have people who tell these things to you, but this is a kind of affirmation that you need to tell yourself every day, that you're enough, you can do this, you're more than qualified. And so even when she was facing, um, uh, a lot of competition, she reminded herself of her mother's words as she was walking on stage to, to perform or audition. She always say, had the mother's words that, that said, let everything Yetunde says be the right thing. Let everything Yetunde says be the right thing. And then she put um, walk on stage. So from this um, chapter, um, one of the, the quotes that stood out for me was, when you feel insecure, why do we allow ourselves to forget our expertise? When you know what you know, and you can carry those skills no matter where you go into uncomfortable, new terrain. Limits are removed, results are open, failure ceases to exist. So here she was talking about um, the impossibilities and the hurdles that we place um, before ourselves. The many of the books that we have read uh, have told us that the limitations, most of the limitations that we have in our lives are not put by our parents, by our colleagues, they're actually put by ourselves. You convince yourself that the, the relationship you're in, that is the best that you can do. To be beaten every day, that is the best, yeah? The pay that you get, you can't get paid any higher. That is where you should stay. The way you're being treated or the friends that you have, you have to cling to them because you can't make any new friends. So the limitations that we put our, our, on ourselves are actually the ones that are stopping us from achieving uh, our goals. The next uh, chapter, chapter eight, is the mirror. Now that was my favorite. <laughs> that was my favorite. I actually thought 
uh, Premier was going to review this, but let me review it. Um, it is about her relationship with, um, it's about empathy. She was, she talks about, the whole chapter is about her boyfriend and the relationship uh, she had with him. Now, she was uh, dating someone called Brian. Now, Brian was really good to her. She was, uh, he was, um, he loved her, he cared for her, and, you know, he, he really um, showed, what do we call it? She felt that he was a good person. He did not have bad habits, no temper tantrums or anything. But there was a problem. One time, um, she came from work. She came from work and found him playing video games. So she was like, why? Are you off today? And yet he was like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm off again. And she was like, but you were off on Monday and on Tuesday. How did you take three days off? And so he was like, anyway, I was fired, you know, and he was home playing video games. And he, that, she continues throughout the chapter talking about a series of his behavior, you know, that she had enabled him. He used not to pay the bills. He did not keep a job. He did not, you know, he just stayed home sleeping, did not want to apply, you know, did not want to, to do anything to improve his situation. And, but because at the back of her mind, she had convinced herself that he was a good guy, was friendly, he was no trouble, he was not cheating. This person was good and good for the relationship. But at one point, as she was growing in her career, she actually felt that, you know, this was not um, this was not a relationship she actually wanted to to be in, and so um, she cut it off, and uh, she broke it off, and she was traveling a lot at that time. But whenever she would come back home, he had they were they were staying together, and then um, when they separated, she assumed that. You know, we are no more. She changed, uh, I think she changed a lot or something. But every time she came back, she would find her channel in uh, like a DSTV in National Geographic, but she never watched National Geographic. So she, she, want, she just wondered why things were not in the right place. And when she would travel for months, she would come back and something is off, you know. And... But she couldn't understand why. Maybe she was losing her memory or she was not paying attention. But the fact is, the guy was actually staying at her house without her knowledge. He would sneak in while, you know, he would follow her on social media and he would know when she's out of town. So he would move in into the house and, and stay for months, for you know, for weeks, until one of the neighbors actually, you know, uh, said something about her. And uh, sort of like um, congratulating them being together. And she was like, but no. And then the neighbor was like, but he's always here. So she found out a different side of, of him. He just wanted to leave off someone. What I learned from this chapter, and it's a quote that she, uh, I think I highlighted here. When you leave a relationship at the right time, you can still cherish the good parts. But when you let go, when you let it go on for a long time, all that you have left will be messy parts. It was difficult to remember the joy that we once had. And this is a, a struggle that we have as women. We may be thriving in our careers in all these different areas, but we have allowed some of the toxic relationships to carry on because of our own self-esteem, where you fear to be single. You fear what friends will say. You fear that you won't have someone to talk to because uh, you've broken up with someone. And some of these areas, we rarely talk about them in, in the book club, but some of the books that we have read talk about the experiences of people 
uh, of people pulling us back, yeah, pulling us back. And one of those is uh, the toxic relationships. And here she talks about, there was another quote on 124, page 124, looking out for yourselves, looking out for ourselves means not accepting less than we deserve. And we don't have to sacrifice that for others. Once you put yourself on the, on the sale rack, it's hard to go back to the full price. I, I, I had to underline that. Once you put yourself on a sale rack, it's hard to go back to full price. So many of us have really discounted ourselves because of the relationships that we keep. And in the book, she gives an example of staying on in a relationship for so long with someone who was not deserving, yeah? And on the, on the last part, 125, she says, dare to have the audacity to ask for what you want. If you're not being treated right, if you feel like you're being treated less than, you have the right to speak, you have the right to, to terminate that friendship, that relationship, because of your own, um, your, your own self value. And this chapter is titled The Mirror. And here she talks about, as a teacher, I hold a mirror up to myself and look for ways to help people hold a mirror up to themselves in class. When you hold up a mirror, do you like what you see? Yeah. Do you like what the life that you are living right now? We need to be able to look closely at our image and see if we're proud of what we see, and what we have become. And the last line in the chapter, she says, I was finally, after the breakup and after leaving LA and going to New York, she had allowed herself to leave, you know? I was finally holding up a mirror to myself, seeing exactly where I'd want to be and what I needed. So this year, this year of self-love, we talk about a lot about self-love, but we think self-love is going for a spa and scrubbing our legs and doing our hair. But self-love goes deeper, even to our emotions. Are we actually exercising that self-love in our emotional space. I'll stop there for now. Uh, I request Primera. Primera, you can continue. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for sharing that part with us. And uh, I'm going to do the rest of the chapters. I'm going to try and hurry because we are a bit, we are, we are a bit uh, tight on time. And uh, the next uh, three chapters are basically uh, a bit well, a bit really emotional for me. I could really identify with what she was talking about. So in chapter 10, she talks about um it's called it's it's titled the chop, which is under the in the acronym, it's under power. So she talks about how she she had wanted to cut her hair for so long, and uh, but she had used her hair as her identity for the longest time. She prided herself in having like extensions. When she was younger, she wanted to do braids. She gives a story at some point where, because she, she they grew up in a very white neighborhood, which the parents had done it intentionally because they were afraid of living in very black neighborhood because of uh, them being black. So they thought, and they thought their children would be safer growing up in a more white neighborhood. So she'd go to school, but she'd be the only one with the kinky hair and the rest of the children would have really, really nice hair. So at some point she gives a story about how she asked the mom for an extension and she cried so much that the mom allowed her to put an extension and it gets to school and it falls off and it's really embarrassing for her. But that didn't stop her. Still, hair was like one of her main ways for her. And she talks about it also from an African context and how hair for us is just not hair. It is 
it is something we do intentionally. We think about it. And it's been like that for generations. Our grandparents, grand, great grandparents, you know, like hair was a big part of their lives. Even part of African culture, we know that hair has been a big part. So just like that, hair was just a big part of who she was. And at this point in her life, she, she wanted to cut it off. And she had told herself for so long that she'd cut her hair off. And... Um, she had relied on her hair and her makeup for so long that she didn't know what to do. So she kept telling herself, when I get to 35, I'll be old and married and I'll be and I'll, no one will care what I think and feel and I'll be able to do it. And she gives a story about how she ends up looking for someone to cut her hair and then she gets it done. But she even wears um, a cape on her way home because she didn't even know to look herself in the mirror. Anyway, so she gets to do it and... Uh, the following day, she looks at herself in the mirror and it's not so bad and she gets used to the look. And even the video that uh, Claire had shared of her interview, she really had short hair and it looked really nice. So I was like, oh, wow. And uh, she, she, she lives through a lot of insecurities and she talks about how we collect a lot of insecurities as we live through our lives. We don't pay attention to the people who are telling us that we are enough. We don't pay attention so much to the people who are encouraging us. We instead are, are looking to, to see the issues in ourselves constantly. And uh, she, she runs a campaign that's around the time of Black Lives Matter. And she runs a cycling a cycling day of a right day, uh, which she calls Speak Up Parade. And that day she thought people wouldn't show up and so many people showed up. She talks about over 20,000 people showing up for that day. And uh, she doesn't talk about her hair until towards the end of the session. And she says how important it was for her to just chop the hair. And uh, in uh, let me just find uh, on page 123, one of her Instagram fans actually uh, quotes her on Instagram and says, I'll, I'll read. When people ask me why I'm obsessed with Peloton, it's this. There is no experience, no commercial brand that has ever led Black women step into their power for the world to see authentically. Tunde is having a moment, not just because she cut her hair, but because she cut off the weight of every stereotype about Black women and their relationship to their sense of self and their sense of worth. Every Black woman watching this understands so in the end, she tells them about her story and how she gets to cut her hair. So part of that chapter, it's um her chapters are not a, very, a, a bit long. And she talks about um beauty uh, being a continuous circle. So many women came back to her, giving them comments about what, at that point, what it actually meant, what it meant for their children who had kinky hair seeing her. She has a niece who has kinky hair and she had to walk her through to help her do her hair and walk her through the whole experience she had been and the experience she had been through. Then she talks about uh, in the same chapter, she talks about us, the way we put people in boxes. We see people, they are too thin, they are too fat, yeah? They are too light, they are too tall, and then we keep them in boxes. She talks about her experience in school and feeling so off because of being black and not even just being black, being really dark skinned. She talks about her mom being much lighter than her and she had gotten her darkness from her dad's side. Um, I know some of us may, may, may relate and may not relate depending on different experiences we've had. But then sometimes it's not really about even being in a physical space where maybe there are more white people than black people. But even generally, like in our lives, when we feel like we are different from other people, you find that for you, you're so different. You may have more weight than others, or you may speak a certain way, or you think or feel about yourself in certain ways. She says that when you're not feeling confident, it's come, it comes back to trust. The voice in our head telling us to do something uh, it may be real or not real. We just need to be able to trust. We need to be able to do things even when we face challenges. Write our narrative and don't let fear hold you hostage. Um, then in chapter 11, uh, this one is always about always there. It, it falls in the acronym part knowledge. And she talks about her relationship with her father, with her mother, 
with her siblings. And in this chapter is when she summarizes uh, the death of both her father and her mother. And when her father dies and uh, he leaves her um, the responsibility, he tells her, I know you're going to step in these shoes. And after he dies is when she, she actually organizes the entire burial. She speaks about him very well because the mom at that point, after losing a son and losing a husband, she was like, she couldn't actually like literally function. So after the, 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 the burial is, has ended, they go back home. She actually says her mom didn't work for two years. The brother was busy taking care of her. She'd visit and leave. So something interesting happened after they went back home after the burial. So the following day, she goes to pick uh, the mother's prescriptions and everyone kept asking, we have not seen your dad. She goes to the dry cleaners. She just goes around like doing the no more um, errands that should have run. And everyone was like, where is your dad? Some people didn't know he had passed away and she had to keep explaining. And it was there that she understood how much we how much power we have in our own lives every day. Like every day we interact with people. Sometimes you want to interact. Okay, I love social media. I love the whole ability to be able to order things online and get them delivered. But so this one just brought me back into reality and, and, and understood how that experience when you go to the market, the women you interact with, you go to the supermarket near your homes where you live, the people you know there, when you're not missing, do they know that, like maybe uh let me see joan or kathy or mariam or viola you're missing that there's, there's something wrong and uh they can uh they can actually tell so she everyone like lit up every time they saw her name and realized who her dad was that that was really uh something i picked and it was really really it just ticked me and i'm like as much as I may want to, I'll, all, I'll also try to, when I interact with people every day, like being able to have that connection with them. Then the other thing was about, there's a comment she makes on page 131. Um, just allow me to find it. It's about, she talks about what makes me rise and uh, the knowledge that I can. So in that, in that chapter, she talks about, she consolidates all her pain, like, she she knew it was coming. She talks about, they all knew that there was a countdown. The dad was really sick and still the day came and the pain is 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 a lot and it's too much. So later on, the dad, the mom didn't work for two years. Then after that, she was in and out of hospital and she also passes away. And she talks about the pain and talks about that, how she finds, she finds strength in the pain, how she was able to pick herself up despite everything. And she talks about being able to, she's, she says she is someone who is able to step up when people step down. When people are in pain, that's when she's able to collect herself, use that energy to be able to get the impossible even done. That's how she, she's able to organize her father's burial. She's able to, uh, find her strength when her mother passes on three years later and she's able to move on with her life. Now, at that point, she asks herself too many questions. She asks herself, where does she belong? You've lost your mom, you've lost your dad. That's the point where I almost cried because it's like my life, having lost your mom, having lost your dad, and then you wonder, who are you? As in, who will be proud of me? when I do something and achieve amazing things, who am I working to please? Remember, she has no children. She isn't married. And then who will celebrate her when she, um, when she accomplishes amazing things? But she still has to find somehow strength within herself. And then she says that our character emerges. And if you take notice, you can, you, you can and yourself. That's the beauty of walking closer to that drumbeat. The pain you experience today reveals itself as a strength for tomorrow. She listens to, uh, she she likes to take time to herself. Uh, like Claire said, she doesn't believe self-care is just, um, she says it's not pedicures and manicures only. It's about taking care of also your soul. Then her mom also talks about her, tells her before she passes away, she talks to her about uh, relations with her brother. And uh, because the mom 
was the mediator. Now she was, she knew she was not going to make it. She was going to pass her and she tells her, please, when I pass on, like make sure that you are the glue. And she says thereafter, she has never fought with her brother again. And uh, she says, she talks about the part where she loses her family within six years, but the three of them that remain, uh, she makes sure that they'll they'll have a good life together and they have and without any issues. Chapter 12 is the last one when she talks about uh, life circles. Basically, she opens the chapter with saying uh, life is like a, a cycling class. It's tough to get started. And even when there is little resistance, it's still tough. And she talks about it like a circle. It's a life circle. Sometimes you plateau. Things seems okay. You're very. You have so much uh, gratitude. Then you get onto a hill, and you don't even know how you're going to make it through the hill. You get to a certain to different points in your life, basically, and uh, different parts of your life will come with different challenges. And but just remember, life is a circle. It goes through. Then she talks about um, when our phones. Battery goes to 1%, 10%, we panic. But when our own lives are in ruin, we are feeling exhausted, you're feeling tired, you still will try to make it work even when you know that you are actually hitting a dead end. So she, she, she actually tells us to stop. And I liked even in that uh, interview online, she, she's asked like, what is that one, one of her interviews online, what is that one thing that you do for yourself? And she says she stops. Like when she sees like life has become too much, she will take her day off, sleep, rest, and do something different. Sometimes we don't take care of ourselves. We wait until we, we can't recover. So having those moments in our lives when we can. Then she said at that point, this is like her closing chapter where she talks about she's, she's come to that point in her life where she's accepted herself for who she is. She's accepted that she's in her mid thirties and she didn't have children. So she has, uh, she has gone to an extreme end of freezing her eggs and so that she can free herself of the fear and to let love find her naturally where she's not thinking about being found and uh in parts of the earlier the, in the book where she talks about being found and her friends keep uh teasing on her about it then she talks about loving and she says loving is risking heartbreak but she says she will still love anyway and we should still love anyway we just open ourselves up for pain but uh so in quote to quote her she says to love is to accept pain to take it in is to grow from it and to love our gain. Says that we keep extending ourselves and then we turn up the voice that believes in you and turn down what doesn't. So in the end, she buys herself a house in New York. She's not waiting to be found. And uh, she buys a home. And when she buys, she finally gets the home. She looks at it and there was a lot of resemblance of that home to the home where she grew up. And uh, she loves living in New York with her dog, Caesar. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to ask Claire to add on something, she, some summary for those three chapters. But those were my takeaways from that book. I love that we can relate to her in uh, being a single lady and uh, living a life where she's fulfilled. And uh, not looking, not looking outwards for certain kind of fulfillment, but it all has to come from within. There's a point also in the book where she talks about decisions being ours. We may want to tie decisions on a spouse. You want to tie decision on parents and siblings, but all those people are just keeping us company. But in the end, the decisions belong to us. Self care is us, part of your soul part of your, uh, it, it can be physical well-being, but let's not forget also the emotional well-being. That's what she talks about. So whether you're single, whether you're married today, enjoy that part. Whether you have children, whether you don't have children, <laughs> whether the children are difficult or not difficult, let's just find that part in us where we are. We, we feel a sense of balance. Thank you.
I'll call Claire to give a few comments and then I will close. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Fumira. I, I could see that, um, <laughs> I, I think last week, Fumira was like, this This book has really, really um, resonated with, with me. And you could see that she was, she was really uh, speaking from a point of emotion, filled with emotions. And that's what we want. Um, for, for, for this book club, for people to be able to read a book and relate to the book in spite of the different seasons that, that you're going through. And um, we chose this book uh, because it, it was like raw, it's authentic, it's raw. She shares uh, not from a point of expertise, but just telling her story and the power of, of her story is what is what's moving the power of knowing that you can actually uh, enjoy what you do uh, the fact that she's not perfect she doesn't have a perfect body she doesn't have a perfect color she doesn't have you know her experience hasn't been all a bit of roses and these are the things that make up our our lives and so um, with many of the books that we have chosen for, for, the, for this year, they are asking us to look within. They're asking us to take care, not of only of out, outside appearance and outside books, but our emotions, our mental health, our hearts. And I think um, when you truly read this book and reflect upon it, you get to, to understand some of the things like uh, things that uh, Primera has highlighted of being still, of being quiet and reflecting on the life that you have right now. And that book, uh, this book actually ushers us into yet another amazing book that we are reading for Feb. It's called Quiet. I shared uh, a copy on the, on the, on the group and uh, Primera can throw more light on that book because she rooted for it and rooted for it. It must, <laughs> it must come in Feb. So we're looking forward to reading it and seeing the power of introverts. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, Thank Primera. Thank you, Claire. The reason I, and the reason I want to read the book, okay, is because most of us, I personally am introverted. I'm an introvert, but sometimes the world is too noisy, noisy for us. So I just want us to read a book where for the first time, like I want to feel it's okay to be introverted. Yeah. And how to be able to cope in a very extroverted and noisy world. So we'll be reading this book this month. I got my copy today, by the way, Claire. I got one from Mary Stock, which was there. I was surprised, but the book was there. And it has another part of it, which is called Quiet Power. Also, they are both at a restock. It was uh, 79,000 if you want to pick a book, a copy, a hard copy. And uh, I'm excited about reading the book. We shall review it um, the first Friday of March. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Primera. Kathy, we haven't given Kathy an opportunity to say something. She's in the chat. Kathy, say something before we close. Hi, ladies. Hi, Claire, Kimura, Carol, Flowers, Flowers. Thank you so much to the readers who joined in. It's me, the chat is so active and busy. Just the time has run out, but everyone agrees that 